place because um, this is really part of uh, a, a movement that I feel so strongly about, which is kind of science for the people. And, and what's now being called grassroots science, what used to be called citizen science. Um, and yet now we need to recognize that the practitioners of science are often not citizens, um, particularly when we look at farm workers and pesticides. And so grassroots science is the better name for um, this enterprise. Um, and, and what that means for food justice and ecological justice. So this um, new tool that's been updated uh, and expanded has been around for 20 years. And we're gonna walk you through how it works. Um, it's a tool for transparency. It's a tool for accessing data across numerous sources in one easy to navigate portal. And because I'm involved now in doing something parallel with fracking, I just, again, truly appreciate the amount of work that goes into this. So it's a, for all of you organizers who are on the call, this is a tool for you to um, draw on the kind of a compilation of scientific expertise. So Pesticide Info, this database, which I make use of myself in my own work, has been in existence for 20 years, but this is now a, a very new retooled and revamped and improved version of this. Um, and it's a way not only for you to get access to the latest science on pesticides, but usually really to use it to build political power. Because without this kind of disclosure, we end up in terrible kind of situations. And to illustrate that, I am going to um, close out my introduction by reading to you a paragraph from an essay that I will publish um, this summer uh, about my own dissertation work, um, which ended up being a dissertation on pesticides, although that wasn't my intent when I first started this project. I went to the headwaters of the Mississippi in the place that we're all now looking at because it's the site for an ongoing occupation of indigenous um, pipeline fighters who are trying to stop line three, which is running through the headwaters of the Mississippi. That's where I did my dissertation work. And I was trying to do it on a, on a completely pesticide separated uh, project looking at browsing by deer, right? So I'm going to just read you this paragraph, and I think you'll understand from it why pesticide disclosure is really important. Here it is. It's 1987. A young woman biologist stands by a pup tent. I should say I wrote this in third person, but that biologist is me. <laughs> a young woman biologist stands by a pup tent. Plumes of goldenrod tell us that it is August. She's been living out here all summer to save money. She's wearing army surplus. At her feet, a hat covered with mosquito netting. She's just come back from the field. Piled next to her tent is a stack of cardboard boxes. They can't stay here long because dark clouds are filling the sky behind her. On the horizon, you can see the rain already falling on the far shores of Lake Itasca. The lid is off of one of the boxes. It's full of manila file folders. She holds one of these folders open in her hands and gazes down at what looks to be a typewritten memorandum dated years earlier. It's a communique of some sort between park personnel and somebody at a state agency. Off to the right, a truck with an official state license plate drives away down a rutted lane. It seems that the park naturalist cleaning out his office at the end of the season unearthed some old correspondence from years past and thought that the grad student from Michigan might find something of interest. So he threw the boxes in the back of the pickup and drove them over to her campsite on the way home. Typed across the top margin of the piece of paper she's looking at are the words, for your eyes only. She's holding in her hands documentation about a discrete herbicide spraying program in the park throughout the 1950s and 1960s. It was conducted by helicopter in the off season, the target hazel shrubs. The purpose was to free pine trees from the understory competition and so enhance their reproductive success and as an added benefit to provide tourists driving through the park pleasant vistas, including improved views of the Mississippi River headwaters. The herbicides used were 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T. Agent Orange, Agent Orange sprayed all over her study site for years. For four field seasons, she had presumed she was decoding an accumulation of natural historical forces that was sculpting the present forest understory and foretelling its future overstory. 
And then it goes on from there. So that's the moment at which I discover my own study site was sprayed with Agent Orange. And it totally changed not only my dissertation because it wrecked um, a couple of years of field work, but it changed the, um, the whole trajectory of my life as a biologist. And for that, uh, the way the story ends, you'll have to read my essay, which comes out this summer, because this is my cue now um, to introduce you um, to um, Andrew Olson, who is the digital project manager at Pesticide Action Network and the project manager for the Pesticide Information Database Upgrade Project. So Andrew, um, tell us about Pesticide Info and walk us through it. Sure, thank you, Sandra, for the introduction. Um, I'm sharing my screen now, so you should all be able to see the homepage for Pesticide Info or the newly revamped Pesticide Info. Um, and I'm just going to walk through a few elements of the site, uh, give you a view of it, and then we will, I think, transition to some Q&A after that. Um, so right from the homepage, the, basically the, the main thing that you can do from the homepage is search by a chemical, uh, search by a product, or do an advanced search. Uh, so we'll just start right there and do a chemical search. And I'm going to search for atrazine. Uh, once you start typing in a few of the letters, it'll, it'll bring up any related chemical that starts with those letters. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and select atrazine, and you can hit enter or just hit the search icon. Um, and this will get you to your search results. So it'll list atrazine or anything with atrazine in the name uh, and uh, some basic columns information here. Uh, EPA registered, a pan bad actor, uh, HHP, which stands for highly hazardous pesticide. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then E registered, you do see that there's no data available. This is currently being updated. So that will be showing some data soon. Uh, but I'll go ahead and go into the detail page for atrazine. And essentially the way this is now organized is through uh, a series of tabs and cards and so the, the data is summarized together, you know, essentially bundled together where it makes sense. Uh, so we're in the overview for the chemical atrazine. And you can see there's a whole wealth of data here, uh, a summary of different information, uh, the toxicity information, some other names for atrazine. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, a couple of the uh, sort of uh, evaluations that we put on these chemicals is uh, whether it's a pan bad actor and these info icons will display some more detail about what that actually means. And then in partnership with Pan International, whether it's a highly hazardous pesticide. And again, any of these info icons will, and they're around the site and other places as well, but they'll explain a little bit what that means. And if you click on a read more, it will take you to one of our resource pages that has even more in-depth information. Uh, this is a highly hazardous pesticide information. So if you're not sure what the term is, uh, usually there's an info icon to help you out. Um, as I mentioned, they're organized into tabs. So there's a health tab on human health issues related to that particular chemical. Um, so in this case, toxicity, re reproductive developmental, cancer, endocrine, et cetera. A um, bunch of information here. Again, info icons if needed. And then at the bottom, you'll see there's uh, some data on uh, poisoning signs and symptoms. If someone's unfortunately been poisoned by uh, one of these chemicals, there is some information here that is always ac uh, accessible via this poisoning symptoms button. It'll just drop you down there no matter where you are on the chemical detail page. It will drop you down here. This is also actually being updated where some of these third-party links will be even uh, work even better than they currently do. But there's just information here on, on what happens if there's a, a poisoning from a particular chemical. Uh, we also have an ecotoxicity tab on environmental issues like water contamination or national drinking water standards. Uh, there is a usage tab, so how the, the chemical is used. So these are some products that contain atrazine. Uh, and uh, the view more will pop open all the, all the products that we met, uh, uh, the data shows. Uh, this uh, will link out to a third-party uh, site on some of the estimated agricultural use for whatever the chemical is that you're on. Um, and if possible, we'll directly link to that chemical on the third-party site. And then um, because we have the data from the state of California, um, this shows primary use of that chemical in the state of California. 
and some related chemicals as well. So a whole host of data in each of these. And then finally, there's the regulation tab. And that will show you uh, where this where this chemical or how or where this chemical is regulated. Um, so international, US, California, etc. cetera. Um, and as I mentioned before, these two, I, I think I mentioned these two icons are related to whether it's a pan bad actor or a highly hazardous pesticide. And if you roll over it, it will show you that. Um, you can always follow these breadcrumbs back to where you started from. So I'll go back to the homepage, just quickly show you a, a product search. So in this case, searching for Roundup, and we'll choose the Roundup custom herbicide and search here, which brings you to the search results for that. And once you select it, you get into the detail for that particular product. Um, again, the same display of, of tabs and cards. So overview of Roundup, you get a summary on data, who the manufacturer and distributor are, some other names for it. Um, you can find out toxicity information about Roundup and some registration and use information. Uh, for example, here's uh, different commodities it's used on. You can use this search function to just pull up, say, blueberries, or also do the view more, which will show you the full list of all the different crops. And then if you wanted to click on you know, cherries or anything, it will take you over to a page that shows you some of the details on that particular crop and other products that are used. So um, I'll jump back to the homepage again. Of course, you can always go there by the logo or search chemicals or products. All three will just take you right back to the homepage again. Um, and then the third thing I'll show you quickly here is the advanced search feature. So you can search, um, do some advanced searching by chemical or product. I'll go by chemical here. And this is if you wanna put in some specific parameters that you're interested in. Um, so for example, here I can choose uh, an insecticide, choose to search by insecticides under uh, chemical toxicity. I'm gonna go under carcinogens and find out if they're you know, possible, probable, known, et cetera, and then see if it's registered in the US, for example. And so when you do that search, um, you will get these same four basic categories that show up on the regular search. And then if you scroll to the right, you'll see the additional uh, parameters that you search for. So you'll see the, the cancer, you know, it's listing whether it's possible or known, um, et cetera. And then if it's, list, if it's uh, in the United States, registered in the United States. So this shows 51 results here um, for a variety of chemicals. Um, you can always download these if you need that data as a CSV or PDF file and do what you need to with that data. You can also uh, just uh, refine those selections right here. And so if you click, I just clicked off US registered. Now we get 133 results and all the data is there that you can scroll through and look at. Um, so yeah, from, I'll go back to the homepage just to reorient. Um, we do, as I mentioned, have a whole section on California pesticide use because state of California provides that data. I'm not gonna do a whole demo on that now, uh, but just quickly show you that you can search by a, a particular chemical, so insecticide, herbicide, et cetera. Um, you can match that up with a particular crop. So avocados, grapes, figs. And then you can also search by a particular region either a whole region or a county within the state of California. And once you do that, as long as the chemical and the crop matches up, um, it will take you to that, to that data. If you choose a chemical and a crop that just, that chemical is not used on that crop and there is no data, it will tell you that and you can start your search again. Um, another, this is actually a new section of the site is our pesticide maps. Some of these are going off to uh, third-party sites, so it will take you over there once you visit the page, um, California Ch Township and the USGS map. Um, but we do have this new global band map. Thanks again to our Pan International partners. Uh, and this map is uh, searchable by a nation or by a chemical. 
So if you're interested in which chemicals are banned in which nations worldwide, you can do that. I'm going to search by, for India here as an example. And you'll see that India lights up. And this shows me that 53 uh, pesticides are banned there, 45, which are listed as the HHP or highly hazardous pesticide, and then eight others. And this is the full list of all those. Uh, and I will show if you search by chemical, I know the aldicarb has been in the news lately. And if we do that search, this map will light up all the nations that have banned aldicarb globally. Also gives you the list down here, 104 nations. And there's the full list of all of them. And yes, the United States is not on that list. Uh, this is also, this map is embeddable on your own site or blog or whatever. If you want to um, grab this code, you can just embed it similar to like embedding a YouTube video or what have you. Uh, a couple other quick things is we have a, a resource library under the alternatives and resources section of the site. So this is obviously uh, always being updated. There's a bunch of content in here now and we'll continue to update it. But a whole host of information, um, whether it's human health, uh, environmental effects, alternatives, et cetera, organized by that. Um, you can also just search for something. So if I search for pets, it will bring up wherever that data, wherever that content is related within uh, that particular resource. And when you get onto the resource, there's a whole host of information within each of those resources. Um, and then finally, uh, Pestine Info now has uh, a blog. So there's uh, a bunch of information here, uh, blogs that are both uh, Pestide Action Network blogs and some guest blogs as well. And uh, part of the work, I should have showed this when I was back at the chemical, let me go back there real quick. Um, but part of what the new functionality of Pestside Info is some integration with the advocacy work of PAN. And so now we do have um, blogs that are on the side here. Um, we will have, this is a welcome to Pestside Info, but this will be an action in the future. So we have related actions that are up here that you can sign an action and take action on some of the advocacy work that we work on. Uh, and that is the end of my demo. Sandra, I will pass it back to you. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, I see that someone in the chat has just said this map is a brilliant organizing tool. I mean, this whole database is just um, so awesome. And um, clearly there are many paths into it. So you have many starting points. If you learn about a chemical you want to research, if you learn about the, uh, you have the name of a pesticide, that's the brand name. If you have a crop, if you have a place, if you have a pet. I mean, um, so um, this is just, uh, an incredible and tool of empowerment. So thank you for showing us how it works. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Zach Page and Tanya Redroad from Toxic Taters, which is a group that I've also worked closely with um, in over, uh, over time and got to speak at one of their conferences before the world um, all closed up. And I'm such a big admirer of this campaign. So Zachary um, Page is the development or development coordinator at Toxic Taters and also an organic farmer in Minnesota. Uh, Tanya Redroad is the campaign coordinator up there at Toxic Taters. And that's a coalition that started in, um, about 15 years ago, I think in uh, 2005, and it's made up of rural farmers and native uh, community members of the White Earth Reservation. Members of the coalition have experienced negative health effects from pesticide drift and have seen effects on animals, to both um, domestic and wild animals. Uh, Zach and Tanya will be speaking to their work with toxic taters and how the pesticide information tool could be used in their own advocacy and campaign context. So take it away, please, Zach and Tanya. Sure. Get the, um, hi, everyone, and thanks so much for the uh, presentation on the website. That's so useful. Um, I could see us using that embed link on our website. So, and all the info on just finding all the chemicals. And thanks, Sandra and Pan. I'm going to share my screen with our, I just made a, I just made a one slide just to kind of go over. Can everyone see that or should I 
make it a big big slide. I don't know if that helps or not. Everyone can can hear me. Good. Yes. So yeah, this is just kind of um um oh now I don't have my notes. <laughs> I might go back to this, sorry. Um yeah, so yeah, our mission of um, bringing together rural farmers and native community members to address uh, direct health and environmental effects. Um, as Sandra was saying, around since 2004, 2005, um, led by uh, um, White Earth Native community member Bob Shimmick and many others. Um, and the main concern is pesticides in the air, drift, and in the water, um, affecting um, yeah both uh, native community in White Earth and rural farmers, and non-farmers and community members that are just living and don't want pesticides in the air or the water. Um, so yeah, some of these projects um, I listed are new, and then some of them um, happened within the last year or two. Um, so the water well irrigation mapping, we have got, I think, around 15 of these uh, really beautiful uh, maps that show um, the susceptibility of if there was like, so I, I suppose, in, for instance, um, if there was a pipeline that went through the uh, line three or any kind of uh, event happens, it would show the susceptibility of where these pesticides would go and who's at the greatest risk. And we've got a uh, really nice, um, and I could share those, those uh, images will be up on our website, toxictators.org um, at some point soon. Um, there's about 15 of those and it's all in, in Minnesota. Um, yeah, so yeah, they, I guess one more thing about them is um, just reading the description here is um, looking at groundwater contamination, susceptibility and water aquifer vulnerability. Um, they don't refer to specific pesticides, but rather a generalized ranking on how easily contaminated the water um, could be based on the geology. Um, geo, I'm gonna say this wrong, geomorphology, uh, soil makeup. And that's coming into account a little bit with our area that has um, the soil makeup um, with a case that we're that I didn't mention in the slide that we're um, um, on with the EWG group uh, lawsuit um, in a Pineland Sands area, which is that it has sandy soil. So that's a really big concern for um, a spread of a newly proposed irrigation wells that um, neighboring organic farmers are concerned with their pesticide uh, drift and uh, contamination with the water. So yeah, just going over these other projects, uh, we did water testing for nitrates in Wadena and a food co-op. Um, we are kind of just ramping up our new season 2021 with a new advisory committee. Um, we've got Tanya who's our new coordinator. So um, we're, we're building ourselves up again this in this 2021 after um, a pandemic. So we're gonna be getting out there a little bit more and do more water to free, provide free water testing for nitrates. And as you know, like uh, nitrates is one of the places that pesticides can show up. And, um, and we're gonna be continuing um, talking with the Minnesota Ag about this uh, biometric testing results. Uh, we saw some preliminary results that aren't official yet. They gave us that, but um, just by looking at that, I think we want to try to keep conversation going and possibly doing an, a second round because um, not many, there wasn't, we don't think that there's enough people um, being tested in the rural environments, um, mainly people, even when they were rural, it was uh, rural towns and not people that live next to the field. So I think there needs to be more uh, people uh, youth and and more samples done uh, of people that actually live near these fields. 
And yeah, working on this podcast, uh, telling um, chronicles of people who might have been um, sprayed or have been affected by pesticides. And yeah, I'll let uh, Tanya take it away with uh, whatever else I might have missed. And thanks again for having us. And yeah, uh, we got our website back, toxictators.org, which has a bunch of info um, that you could check out as well and resources. Um, Jack, before we turn it over to Tanya, could you drop your um, Toxic Taters uh, website yeah. just right in the chat? There's been a request for it. Okay, Tanya. All right. Well, bonjour, everyone. Um, I'm Tanya Redmond. I'm the new coordinator um, at Toxic Taters. <laughs> um, so Zach covered a lot of that good stuff. So I'm, I, I'm not going to spend too much more on that. Um, I think just me coming in really brand new, um, you know, it's just devastating to hear um, this community having to, um, you know, deal with these uh, things. So I think for me, my biggest task is just going to be keep exposing what's happening um, and just engaging local potato growers to help expose, again, that exposure. Um, and putting facts out and the realities of those exposures. Um, I, you know, kind of staying on top of legislation and different things that are, are coming through that way. Um, and just promote and demand uh, more organic potato growing communities. So calling for safer toxic or, or <laughs> calling for safer taters. Um, and so that'll be just kind of where we're at. We're, our, I mean, we're getting our advisory committee going. And um, I think that's just gonna be a big step for us to kind of revive everything. I know with everybody, COVID's just been a, um, a slow, slowed some things down, but um, I guess my job will be to speed things up. <laughs> um, and Zach has been uh, really awesome with um, kind of keeping me in the know of what has uh, some of those accomplishments, the, the McDonald's campaign, you know, we'll be working on that, um, that podcast uh, to, you know, tell people's, uh, you know, their, their narrative of what's going on in that area. And we already have a, um, we already have a wonderful um, gal who's willing to do that. So I think we're just like, things are just coming together. Um, I'm looking forward for this information to, for us to be able to share this information. I already had someone reach out to me asking about, well, one, the mapping is awesome too, that um, the toxic taters did previous, um, because that was also something they were looking for. And this information couldn't have just came at a sweeter time. <laughs> um, and, you know, looking at all those pesticides. So I'm excited to be able to give this to, to um, those who are requesting different things um, so that I don't necessarily have to be the expert, but there's, here's some info, even though it's California, you know, those pesticides are pesticides. So I, I'm really glad that this is, this, this is here. I mean, that's, and that's a lot of work, <laughs> kudos. <laughs> um, so yes, I look forward to just sharing that information. So thank you, miigwech. Thank you, Zach and Tanya. Um, again, my great um, sort of admiration for what you're all doing in Minnesota um, with community organizing there, um, using the potato as kind of the starting point for an amazing nar narrative that's really kind of coming out of Minnesota. And um, I, I just appreciated when I was um, had got to be your guest, the way in which the in indigenous community and rural settler communities were really finding common ground around this issue and um, protecting the land. So <laughs> you guys are heroes. <laughs> okay, it's my great pleasure now to introduce you to um, the senior scientist at um, Pesticide Action Network, who's the most, who's the least intimidating scientist you'll ever meet. And I'm pleased to say she used to um, be my housemate when we were in grad school together at University of Michigan. And um, I should say, I suppose that while I was looking through all my old field notes to write that essay about Agent Orange in my study site, what fell out of my field notebook, but a photograph of Marg and me having um, Thanksgiving dinner at our, um, graduate student apartment and we look really drunk mark <laughs> so that's my way of saying that you're not an intimidating scientist 
Um, so um, this again is Margaret Reeves, PhD, senior scientist at Pesticide Action Network, and she's a member of the Pesticide Info Build Team. Um, over to you, Dr. Reeves. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> oh, I, I remember that event. <laughs> <laughs> a really funny hat on. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you, Andrew, for that overview. I've been in the weeds on this project for so long that I failed to see the forest for the trees. So thank you, Andrew. So I'm just going to talk a few minutes um, about the resources that we rely on, that we have relied on to build pesticide info. Um, it's a collection of information from many government resources around the globe, and at least in one case, a non-government resource because endocrine disruptors have, have been inadequately characterized by governments or not uh, consistently categorized. So in that case, we actually go to an authoritative non-government resource. But the vast majority of the resources are from government uh, sources around the globe, um, and we and I'm going to list some of those, but we also add to that our own pan touch. Uh, Andrew touched on our definition of highly hazardous pesticides and pan bad actor, which as he pointed out in the uh, info icons, you can get more detail on that. Um, and there are a couple of cases that we do, as Andrew also pointed out, um, link out to third parties where they do a, a better job or can update it more readily than we can and why repeat that. Um, and I just wanted to mention a couple of those. Uh, uh, the Department of, Pestis, uh, Department of Public Health in California with an excellent uh, California-based mapping tool. As we've all seen, the USGS maps on pesticide estimates, est estimations of pesticide use. And we also link out to reporting uh, information that is managed by Migrant Clinicians Network across the US. So that's a couple of the linked out sites. The other sources we uh, heavily rely on US EPA uh, for all sorts of information on products, uh, particular contents, registration, health effects, uh, treatment, sign and, signs and symptoms, uh, the international uh, chemical safety cards in multiple languages. It's unfortunately one of the few places where we do have different language capabilities. At this point, the site is mostly in English. Um, California Department of Pesticide Regulation uh, provides detailed information on pesticide use and pesticide illnesses. And we flag that not only because the data are available, but it's an illustration of how powerful access to those kinds of use data and illness data can be. We've used that to fuel many campaigns in California over the years, and it's a good model for other states and, and nationally as well, which of course is an ongoing uh, dream to have national pesticide use reporting. Um, uh, the, the World Health Organization, uh, uh, International Agency on Cancer Research, um, National Toxic Program in the US, and, and other sources. Somebody um, asked in the chat about the ban map, and the question was about uh, whether it just shows bans or unregistered pesticides. That was a, that question was right on, hit the nail on the head. The reason that there are so few bans in the U.S. is that many of those pesticides that we don't see used is because they're not registered for use. But it doesn't mean they might not be registered again in the future. And as uh, Andrew pointed out with aldicarb, that's exactly the, the situation right now. Aldicarb was unregistered for a long time and is right now in a provisional reg two-year registration for use on citrus in, in Florida. So good question there. Um, but right now, uh, that ban map literally shows only the bans. Um, I, I just, I'll make one other um, point there. Uh, and if people are familiar with the old site, we had a lot of information on ecotoxicity. And those data are all maintained by EPA. And what we had was a static presentation of the one time when we 
uh, uploaded it all. And so now what we do for the detailed tax eco tax information is we show people, we walk people through how to get those data directly from EPA. So, so you can still get those data, but we don't um, show those except for the data that uh, Andrew pointed out about water, groundwater toxicity and drinking water standards. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. That was just a real quick, quick overview of some of the resources. So I'll hand it back to you, Sandra. All right, um, thank you. That it was an opportunity for us actually now to ask you all to um, ask a scientist. So these are, we're gonna do, um, uh, we're now transitioning to the kind of interactive part of the uh, conversation where we take questions and they're going to be in two waves. First, to ask a scientist. Um, so these are your scientific and technical questions for Marg and then we'll open it up um, to pose questions to all of our panelists. And um, I did see one question go by Marg. I'm going to ask you first and then I'm going to um, behind the scenes, I'm getting um, a compilation of questions. This uh, this whole P Pesticide Action Network team is obviously really good at compiling things, so it's coming at me fast here. But in the meantime, um, here's a question for you, Marg. Um, what, what do you do if you don't have a brand name or a chemical name um, and you want to figure out what's being used on crops? Uh, well, if you're in California, it's, you can look at a particular crop and get a list of the pesticides. You can get the quick look as what are the top 50 pesticides. Uh, you can get a more comprehensive list uh, as well. Um, you can you that could be a starting place. Oh, thank you, Andrew. So actually, Andrew can. So, so this is the California use page. You can see the top 50 pesticides. You can select your crop there. Yeah. Excellent. So there's a concrete example there. Um, the other thing is that you could use this as a starting point for looking elsewhere. So if you see what, I mean, California is an enormous uh, agricultural state with virtually all the crops grown elsewhere, almost. Um, and so if, if you use that as a starting point, then you can get at least a rough idea of what might be the case uh, in your, uh, state or country, though, of course, it's not comprehensive. Right. So in other words, even if you lived, in, as I do, in upstate New York and was wondering what was being used on the apple orchard down the street for me, I could start with the California database to see what kind of pesticides are typically used on apples. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are a handful of states have a have modest reporting. No states have the kind of reporting that we have in California, but it is again an excellent model and something to be pushing for uh, at the state level if if uh, exactly. campaigns were yeah. so I mean, organized. We are, yeah, we in New York are very jealous of the California registry. And there's a follow up question about that registry. Um, what can you tell us about the source data for the California registry? So all. Uh, commercialized users of pesticides. Every licensed user is obligated to report all of the pesticide use that they have. And it's listed as either agricultural or non-agricultural. And we focus on the agricultural. Um, the, they have to be listed with the Department of Pesticide Regulation. And those data are listed by crop, by application site, uh, application method, time of year, um, and of course the county. So there's there's a wealth of information there that, that we can use. Okay, so next question is, um, what can you tell us about um, data on persistence and duration in soil or in plant tissue for pesticides? Is that somewhere on the site? Um, there is information about uh, persistence in water. Um, I would have to dig in to see what we've got in soil. Um, what was, oh, plant tissue, we do not have information on persistence in tissue. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you would get by going to, by asking a laboratory that does tissue analyses. Um, but just off the cuff, um, pesticides don't stick around very long. And if you do have a tissue sample that you think might be contaminated, first thing you do is stick it in a plastic bag and put it in the freezer <laughs> because that will, 
slow down the, the decomposition of that. And then if you find a lab to do the analysis, then, then that would be the next step. But we don't have those data. Okay, that's good to know. I should say I'm very interested in now that there's so much drought in the West and fracking is really still booming. Um, there's a big push because of the dr dr ongoing drought to reuse fracking wastewater in irrigation for crops and for livestock watering. So there's a lot of questions we don't know about plant uptake of those chemicals and their persistence. So this whole idea of chemical persistence in crops and plants and their uptake by roots is a huge uh, data gap for both pesticides and fracking chemicals that really need a lot more research. Um, next question for you, Marg. Is there some data about degradation time of specific active ingredients on the website? Um, again, uh, there is that within with respect to water. Um, and I and otherwise, that is a I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about how you're going to update the website as new types of pesticides that are not even necessarily chemicals um, start coming onto the market. So the if you look in the chemicals database with the um, tens of thousands of chemicals that we have in there. Um, some of them would not be, are not listed as pesticide active ingredient. They might be consist, uh, listed as inert ingredients. I put in quotes, many of which were at one time or another listed as pesticides. So there's a bit of a gray area there. So the chemicals listed are much beyond what we think of as just active ingredient chemicals. There are other chemicals listed there that are listed as pesticides that we might not think that they are, but they are biological pesticides. So for example, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a common organically approved treatment based derived from soil bacteria. Uh, that target particular lepidopterist insects and other insects as well. That's just one of the most common ones. So um, periodically we update those lists. There are a number of different resources that we use to up to identify new chemicals, and then those are incorporated into the into the uh, website. I don't know if that totally answered the question. Feels like it. Um, I feel like I'm a member of your dissertation committee. <laughs> 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 Please address <laughs> how parent chemicals and the salts of parents are addressed. That's a good question, actually. That is a very All good question. Did not spell that out. So many users, including public agency staff, did not recognize salts of chemicals to reflect the same toxicity as the parent chemical. Um, so they are. That's a, in fact one of the things that uh, the pan that. Kristen mentioned, Susan Kegley, who was the um, developer of this website way back, and she still is on contract for uh, not just identifying the new chemicals, but for identifying them into groups of common action and also including the parents and the degradation products. So we, in fact, identify uh, that relationship as well, whether a chemical is a parent, a degradation product, and whether its chemical activity is in a group, um, sort of a, a toxicologically active similar group. So that's in there as well. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, here's a question that was actually answered in the chat, but I just want to pose it and answer it so everyone knows in case you're not following along here. Um, it's, it has to do with how you're using the word pesticides and whether it includes herbicides or not. And um, Kristen answered that question to remind us that we use pesticides as the umbrella term. And then under that, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, et cetera, those are all types of pesticides. Um, so let's see. Um, this is, I think this is gonna be the last really science-based question. And then I'm going to now open it up for all kinds of other questions to the rest of the panel, which can still include um, questions to Dr. Reeves. And if I've missed your question, just um, pose it again. So um, Dr. Reeves, are the US EPA injunction listed pesticides addressed in the database? That's a good question. Um, if they, I believe so, though the regulatory status may not be. We don't, we don't have listed whether a particular chemical is in review or not. We just have, is it currently, is it at the time of update, 
currently registered or not. I, I hope that answers the question. I think that's a good answer. Um, all right, so um, those of us who love to nerd out on the, you know, the uh, organic chemistry and the salts of pesticides and parent compounds and everything else. <laughs> that was our moment. And at the time has now, uh, you can continue with that. But now let's hear um, questions for our whole panel that may not be so um, technical. And I almost st I'll start off with one that's right in the chat. Um, so this question is that my homeowners association says the landscape crew is allowed to use organic products. Um, and then the word organic is in quote, but I saw a large sprayer on a work truck. So what exactly do they mean by organic? Which is kind of a great question, right? Because that word organic has, um, is a shape shifter of a linguistic term. So why don't I throw that open to anyone on our panel who'd want to try to take that? I'll, I'll take that and then maybe others can chime in. Um, it, that term could be like people using the word sustainable. Now, if it's organic, um, it should be, uh, approved for organic production, and that appears on the OMRI, O-M-R-I list of all the products that are approved for organic production. That doesn't mean that an individual might misrepresent, as is commonly the case, and call it organic. But there is actually a classification for things that, can, that are allowed for organic and not. We don't have that on the site, nor did we in the past, but that's one of my uh, wish lists for the future is to have actually a list for OMRI approved uh, products as well. Okay, here come the, some of the general questions. Um, and the first one is about atrazine, um, that one of our most abundantly used pesticides here in the US. Um, the question is, is it prohibited here in the US? Why or why not? given that it's banned in every in other countries. Where can we find out where pesticides are banned internationally? So um, let's see, Andrew, do you wanna try that one? Sure, we're going back to the ban map, international ban map, is that what it's referring to or is it? Um, it it's a general question, but I think you could direct the, um, the questioner to where to find that answer. Yeah, so if, um, sharing my screen again, hopefully, uh, going to the uh, back to the global ban map. Um, and so was it searched by a chemical for the country? Was that the question? Um, if so, you can, I did the example of Aldicarb under the global ban map, and that, that um, lights up all the nations and lists them um, that, that have, and as Margaret uh, clarified, have I guess permanently banned, is that correct, Margaret? This particular chemical? Correct, correct. Yeah. Um, versus like not re deregistered it. Um, and then of course you can search by a particular nation to see what, what uh, I think I did India before, uh, what particular chemicals are banned within that particular nation. So you can so go could, could you show us the map for all the countries where atrazine is banned? Sure. Uh, 37 countries banned it. So that's the answer to how you can find out <laughs> where atrazine is banned. You just use this mapping function. Um, so then the, the why question is, um, why is it not banned in the, in the US? Um, Marg, you wanna try that one? Well, Kristen was raising her hand. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I missed you. Kristen, go ahead. No, that's okay. And then Marg, if you have something to add, I think, uh, yeah, that's a really good example of um, how far behind we are in many ways in this country in terms of our regulatory system and uh, the fact that our rules really don't protect public health and the environment as well as they do in some other countries. And the, I would argue, we would argue as an organization that part of the root cause of that is that there is much more access for the pesticide industry to influence those policies. Um, and so that they're basically, you know, that's part of the reason that atrazine hasn't been banned is that the pesticide industry is, is in conversation regularly with, has more access to those regulators than is true in many other countries. So Mark, do you wanna add anything to that? Oh, I think that did it. Yeah, I would just add, um, I mean, this is one of the chemicals I've written about as well, that, um, you know, atrazine 
was born the same year I was in 1959, which so it makes it a 61 year old pesticide. And it was banned for use in Germany in 1993 on the grounds that it was inherently unmanageable because the way it works is it's a systemic pesticide. Um, so it's like, it has to be in the rainwater to get inside of the, um, in, inside of the organism to, to do its poisonous thing, which means that it, it just is going to be um, flowing as a falling curtain of chemicals into groundwater, into surface water. And so, I mean, Germany looked at the situation and decided that made it inherently unmanageable, that no amount of regular, no regulatory framework could kind of contain it within the field that it was in. So the science is all on the side of saying that um, this is a kind of pesticide, kind of like smoking in airplanes, that no amount of rules or regulations is going to make it safe. And, and that, I think, was the correct decision. And we haven't taken that decision here in the U.S. And I think that's more about the political power of the petrochemical industry over our political process than the science. Um, so question, is there a reason why you didn't keep the wine grapes separate from grapes at the higher search levels? It does show up as separate in the results, but not at the top level terms. Um, that's simply a function of the way the data are presented uh, by the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Yeah, so right. we don't manipulate those, the data at that level. Yeah. Oh, and then there's a question for me. Is it true that fracking water can be used on crops? Yes, it's absolutely true. And um, that's a thing in California. Um, it's becoming a thing in other states like uh, Texas and New Mexico, where the amount of fracking waste just keeps growing as the drought, as the kind of climate change induced drought keeps making fresh water more scarce. So that creates pressure to um, open up all throughout the West, the use of fracking water for both livestock watering and for agriculture. Um, we have some, we compile that data in my own database here in the compendium um, on uh, scientific medical and media findings demonstrating the risks and harms of fracking, which you can find on our own website, Concerned Health Professionals New York. We try to pull together all the data on use of fracking chemicals and irrigation. It's, um, there's a lot of data gaps. Um, can, one, can one search for neurotoxins as a category? Andrew, how about you try that one? Oh, I might pass that to Margaret. Um, well, sure. we, not as such, though, acute, you can search for acute toxins. So that includes neurotoxins, but also would include um, uh, those that cause other acute symptoms like respiratory, uh, skin problems, et cetera. So separately as neurotoxins, no. Well, and then there's also the category of cholinase, cholinesterase inhibitors, but that's just a relatively small subset of organophosphate and carbamate pesticides that have a neurological endpoint, um, that particular neurological endpoint. I am, showing the, I am showing the advanced search that gets at some what Margaret was just talking about. Um, so I selected insecticide, but of course you could select an herbicide or what have you. And then uh, uh, I cannot pronounce that, but cholinesterase <laughs> inhibitor and a slightly acute toxin, moderately acute toxin, et cetera. You can add those to your search parameter and then do a search and that data. It, it does show up here if you scroll over. Um, and of course you can download it as a CSV if you wanna pull it into Excel or do what you want with it. Great, well, and of course insecticides were designed to be, um, to kind of cause the insect to electrocute itself um, through a neurologic, being a neurological poison. So um, you can kind of, if you're, if you're looking at insecticides, it's a good guess. It's a good starting point to assume there's neurotoxicity for sure. Um, all right, let's see what we got here. Would a country's use of pesticide use to control invasive species be listed at PAM? It would be cool to see activist groups who are working on Pesticide action, are there any plans for connecting organizations working on campaigns? Okay, so those are kind of two different questions. So let me just throw them out and you guys can decide who to who should answer them. So what about um, use of pesticides to control invasive species? Is that kind of um, separated out as a category? And then secondarily, um, are there plans for connecting organizations who are working on pesticide campaigns? 
I'll, I'll start that. So um, in California, where the pesticide use data are fairly comprehensive, um, yes is the general question, because invasive species would be, for example, invasive weeds. You'd be looking at herbicides. Um, if, if licensed applicators are applying herbicides against those invasive weeds, yes, it would be listed. Similarly, if there are invasive insect pests, um, those would be used on either a particular crop um, or they could be used on in landscaping um, or roadsides and all of those are listed sites for application. So as long as a licensed applicator is applying the pesticide, then yes, it would be uh, included. Great. Um, how about, let's throw this question about activist groups working on pesticides and connecting organizations. Let's throw this over first to um, our friends at Toxic Taters. I'm really curious to know what their perspective on that is. Zach or Tanya, do you want to take that one? Um, well, so I'm just getting started. So um, I don't have an exact answer, but I know that with what I've done with um, work that I've done, like being part of kind of the um, no dapple and stop line three and different things like that. I hope that through the stuff that I've done that I can help um, kind of pull some of those people together that are, because people are asking and wanting to be involved. So I don't know all of those who are doing it, but I'm going to find them. <laughs> and then, if, you know, maybe that's our lead. Maybe that's what we do is um, try and figure out um, who's all doing what. I'm, I know Pam, they have, I've been watching their webinars and doing things. They, they have uh, quite a peop, uh, quite a bit of information on people who are doing things. Maybe um, we just need a, a way to connect and have a bigger platform for everybody to chime in to that and get connected. So, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm new, but I'm willing to like take that on and do something. So uh, that would be a great idea. So I'm sorry, I didn't really answer the question. <laughs> I kind of more said that I'd like to see that. So I feel like you guys are already doing it in this way. You're bringing all kinds of different people together around pesticide issues. So I, I feel like you're kind of the model for the, for the rest of us. Yeah. Well, I hope we can keep doing that. Yeah. Um, so many questions and they're all so smart. Um, and what, can I jump in on that one just real quick? I'm sorry. Uh, just on the question of connecting activists, I just wanted to lift up that that's really core to a lot of what PAN does um, here in the US in our North America office. And we have um, kind of, we work through in coalition, especially we do a lot of state-based advocacy. So we're kind of in deepest coalition with groups in California, Hawaii, Minnesota, and Iowa. Um, and we, the reason I wanted to jump in is just to highlight that we're, we're about to launch a new program that sort of leverages that experience. It's gonna be called the Farm Policy Commons um, that takes lessons that we've learned from our advocacy work in those states and connects with activists in other parts of the country working on pesticides and kind of pesticide and adjacent issues. Um, so we're really excited about that new program. And um, so just wanted to lift that up as well. Well, that kind of connects to the next um, question, which Kristen, why don't you start us off with this one? What's the best way to promote what um, PAN is doing? Classes, presentations, social media, podcasts, are there points or sound bites that you recommend? Oh, that's an interesting question. I'd say to start off, um, if you're not already, follow us on social media. Our comms team uh, produces a lot of materials. Also, you can go to the pana.org website to sign up and get regular alerts. And we do um, every other week, uh, we uh, send out blogs that are kind of what's happening right now, what are the top issues, and all of it is geared toward how people can engage and get involved in these issues. Uh, so, and within that, there are also, you know, oftentimes, for, especially on social media, there'll be content that's easy to share that, that is kind of at that talking point level that folks can use to, to reach out to friends and family if they want to engage around these issues. I don't know, if, Andrew, do you want to add anything to that with your comms team hat? Uh, they, they, if you didn't say it, that when they go to our website, they can uh, either sign up to be on our mailing list or just take an action and you'll be on our mailing list as well. And we'll be sending you uh, all of our related actions and uh, newsletters and et cetera. 
And that same question um, is also one of our um, one of our listeners asks Ta Zach and Tanya much the same question. So um, Tanya, Zach, if you're behind your buffalo and garlic avatars, <laughs> can you tell us uh, how um, folks can promote what you're doing? Um, classes, presentations, social media, et cetera. They might have stepped away. That's what I do when I put my avatar on. Um, well, we can come back if, oh, there she is. How can um, we promote you? Um, so we do have our website and I was hoping Zach would, um, I think maybe he even already had put it in the chat, but did, yeah. I, okay. I, and so it is in the chat and that also we have um, a way for people to kind of um, put their information in so that we can keep them informed. Um, so, and we do have a Facebook page. Um, so I think those are like kind of the, probably our best platforms right now. Great. Um, so in this list of really good questions, um, is there information in the database on herbicides typically used on golf courses? Yes, that's listed as turf. That's the site. And there's a lot of herbicide used on turf. So that would, um, I, I, I can't remember whether it's just, whether golf courses is separated out or not. Um, we could find that out, but I just can't remember. Yeah, turf is a funny word because it's not a word that we use in science and it's not really a word that we use as people who have yards and play, play golf. It's a kind of a funny la landscaping term, but yeah, turf is definitely what you'd want to look for if, if you're worried about grass. And Andrew is checking it out for us. If you put in golf, does golf course come up? Oh, ornamental turf, there you go. So that might be it. Yeah, this is of course in the California section here um, that you can search by it, by the crop in California section. So I didn't see golf as in the drop down here, but there is uh, ornamental turf, which is likely it. Yeah. 100% positive. Um, Okay, here's a good one. There's so much false advertising and greenwashing in the lawn care industry. Terms like all natural, organically based, pet safe, they're used to lure in consumers. <clears throat> in organic lawn care, NOFA OLC Northeast Organic Farming Association Organic Lawn Care would be a gold standard certification process in the East. However, companies will go through the certification process to pick up a few extra organic customers. They're not supposed to lead customers away from organic back to chemical lawn care. However, this is an industry that's regularly spraying toxic chemicals on you, your kids, and your pets. Do you really want to trust them on honest advertising standards? Um, goes on to say, an honest company that uses organic practices can use compost tea from a sprayer and or tick mosquito control that is reasonably helpful uh, adju adjuvant with cedar, rosemary, garlic oil. If you have more questions on lung care, pesticides, see beyond pesticides or contact uh, Ellen. And um, so this is a comment from Ellen Fine. <clears throat> and so she uh, leaves her um, email address. So all of those of you who wanna know more about lung care practices, she's your resource here. Um, Anna, how am I doing here in terms of questions? I hope I didn't miss anything. Yeah, I just dropped in a couple new ones, Sandra. Sorry, they're getting a lot's coming in, so probably buried in the chat, but. Why don't you go ahead and pose them? Yeah, so one question that came in recently was, um, will the site be updated to include genetically engineered pesticides such as gene silencing sprays? That's definitely on the wish list and it's not there yet. <laughs> it would be a big undertaking, but absolutely, and I agree about its importance. Mark, can you say a little bit more about um, the what government data is available for that currently? Um, I can't, but I know that there is um, one of the experts is in the audience here. Um, if Dana, you're there and I can put you on the spot, Dana Pearls from Friends of the Earth has been following uh, gene editing technologies and the like. Oh, can we even have an audience person 
chime in? I don't know if we can. We cannot, but Dana, oh. if you want to drop something into the chat box, please feel free. Sorry, I can't answer that in more detail. Thanks, yeah. Mark. And Anna, do you have, while you're waiting for um, that to come in, do you have other questions you want to pose for our panelists that I have overlooked? Yes, I'm doing some scrolling myself. Um, one of the questions we could pose is about the, um, the date of listed bands. Is it possible to retrieve the date um, or year of bands that are listed on the site? I can jump in on that one. So in addition to the map, up at the top of the map page is a link to our banned pesticides page, which is in the resource library. And that outlines the criteria and methodology that our partners at Pan International use to create the consolidated list of bands. Um, and within that, I believe in the, the attachment, I believe they do note the dates of the bands. So down, I think it's toward the bottom of the page, there's actually an attachment to a PDF that has all the data in it. Um, and they'll have information there on the band date. So it's a little bit buried, but it is there. Um, checking for more questions, and I don't see any more in my box. Anna, what about you? These are such smart questions. I, I just feel like your users are going to be um, really adroit at making use of this amazing resource you have. Yeah, thanks, Sandra. We had another question come through about um, the possibility of downloading a list of pesticides that has been um, that have been banned. So is the data um, exportable? So I can answer that one. The document that I mentioned includes the full spreadsheet that has all of the um, all of the data of the countries and the pesticides and which ones are highly hazardous and so on. So that's in the that's just, uh, the Pan International kind of summary um, list of all the consolidated bands. So the answer is yes. The short answer is yes. So there is a question about um, I don't know the I don't know this pesticide boscolid. It doesn't show up at a top level. Is it in the top 50 pesticides on wine grapes? Um, shows up there, but it's not a searchable term. That's a pesticide I don't know. I would have to look into it. I, I don't know either. Sometimes I'll just add that sometimes if you put a, a term in there and it shows up as no result, but you hit return, you'll get a result anyhow if it's listed as one of the alternate names for a pesticide. So be a little bit persistent, try again, and otherwise it might not be in our list, though I'd be surprised if it's, yeah, I just, I can't tell you in detail. Um, it has come time for me to kind of wrap things up with all of you. I, I see there's a few more questions um, still remaining, so I, I'm going to trust that those questions can be answered by um, the, the staff here. And uh, Anna, you'll make sure that those who pose the questions get really good um, answers. Um, I want to let you know that the, a recording of this, um, our discussion today, will be available in the coming weeks. So please keep your eye on the inbox. Um, and then you can make th this whole conversation um, available to all the folks who couldn't hear it in real time. Um, and uh, if your questions are not in the chat box and you, you um, can't really formulate them, you can still ask questions about anything you heard today um, by reaching out to community at pana.org, just community at pana.org. And of course, if you want to support the work of Pesticide Action Network, um, if you, you know, we all need to kind of crowdsource this kind of um, resource. Um, you can uh, make a donation at just pana.org. So I would just like to close this out here by reminding us that um, the one of the um, original scientists who helped begin the process of 
pulling back the veil of secrecy on pesticides and um, revealing them for the poisons that they are, um, Rachel Carson um, did heroic work in her, her work, uh, Silent Spring. And what she couldn't say while she was writing it and the secrets that she had to keep while even as she was disclosing the secrecy around um, pesticides is that she was actually dying of breast cancer while she was um, working on Silent Spring. Um, she also had to keep secret the fact that she had a woman lover and she lived in fear that both of those facts about herself as a woman scientist at that moment in time in the early 60s would be used to impeach her science. And so even as she was working to disclose the harms of pesticides and get this kind of data to create the kind of first database in the form of her book, Silent Spring, she had to keep her own um, very, her autobiographical secret. So I just wanna remind us that at the end of her life, when she was putting the last chapters of Silent Spring together, she was, um, her breast cancer had spread to her cervical vertebrae and made her writing hand go numb and she couldn't write anymore or even type anymore. And so I want you to just imagine <laughs> that in her home in um, Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, a lot of women all gathered around her during that at the end of her life. Um, her research assistants, her housekeeper, um, just a whole lot of women who um, provided uh, data to her, including women who were part of um, a, a citizen group, we would call it now grassroots uh, science, um, who, uh, call themselves um, the Committee Against Mass Poisoning. And they were in Long Island and they had noticed birds dropping dead in their backyards around the um, bird baths when the aerial use of DDT and other pesticides were being deployed. And they um, opened up a space for this kind of research and disclosure to happen because they sued um, and they, they had the power of attorney. And their case um, on the harms of pesticides went all the way to the Supreme Court, but then it was lost on a technicality. And so pesticide harm fell into secrecy again. They weren't able to kind of blast it open through the courts. But because they had boxes and boxes of data that had been on the harms of pesticides that had been kind of secretly compiled, they were able to share that with Rachel Carson. And so she became, because of her amazing writing skills, became the database. <laughs> they, she was like the one woman pesticide action network database working in her home to bring this data out to the rest of us. But I just wanna point out that she actually didn't do it alone. That, that even though we have this, her, like the mythology around Rachel Carson is that she was like this lone woman spinster scientist, right? This very gentle person standing alone like the, Chinese guy in front of the tank, in front of the pesticide industry. Au contraire, she was actually surrounded by a whole team of women who were just as smart and full of knowledge about pesticides who had actually sued the industry, taken it all the way to the Supreme Court, boxes and boxes of data, hauled them to her house. And then when she was at writing the last of her book, she actually dictated just speaking the words of the last couple of chapters and then women typed it up for her. So that was the first pesticide info database. And I see that what Pesticide Action Network has done here um, in a different historical moment has really blasted the doors open on the secrecy and is providing us this incredible tool for our own organizing and for our own empowerment. And it's really on us to support it, support Pesticide Action Network and use it um, and kind of go tell it on the mountain. So thank you all for um, being part of this amazing discussion and um, you know, roses and cupcakes and rainbows to Pesticide Action Network for all their amazing work. I'm so proud of all of you and so grateful. Thanks. Over to you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, so in wrapping up, I wanted to let folks know that going forward that we will be updating the site. Uh, we're shooting for twice a year as new data becomes available. We're also, as Sandra said, open to feedback and input. Use that community at pana.org uh, address and, and we'll get your feedback. We're always looking to improve it. And, and I just wanna wrap up by thanking all of you for joining us and also thanking Zachary and Tanya for telling the story of Toxic Taters and my colleagues, Andrew and Margaret for, for all of their work and also Emily and Anna 
uh, for getting us all organized. And, and thank you so much, Sandra, for, for holding this space for us. Um, really appreciate you being here. So thanks everyone. And um, we'll be in touch again soon. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Good job. <laughs>